episode 236 of the Bevan James Isle Show, the All Blacks High Performance Triangle. Alrighty, team, welcome along to episode 236 of the Bevan James. I'll show you a fortnightly podcast on the behaviours that create a lifetime love of exercise so you can get all the benefits that come alongside it. I, I, I've got to be honest, I've got no interviews and I may not have interviews for the next couple of episodes just because I'm so bogged under by the last moments of getting this book ready for market. We have got an official launch date now, the 4th of July is when the book is coming out. Uh, it's very exciting. I've got my first edition of the print. What happens when you send it to the printer is they they basically send you a print version of what it will look like when it's finished before you confirm the print. And I got that the other day and I'm over the moon of how it's looking. Um, it's, 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 I'm like, I couldn't be happier. So that's really exciting. But up until the 4th of July, I've got a lot of work to be done. So basically this show here, I, I might try get an interview, but it, you might find over the next kind of three episodes, it's just going to be me doing a Bevan show just because the, the prep and getting an interview, uh, getting someone on often takes a bit more time. And, and I, again, I'm very singular focused in life right now. And I like it actually. I like it being this singular focus where it's just that kind of, the things, the responsible things you have to do, do, and then outside of that, get back to your singular focus, and that is just get this book project done. And as much as I've got a lot on my plate up until that point in time, I know that if I'm focused and I have this singular focus, everything will be done. So it's quite a stimulating time. You know what? You know what? You, I don't know. Maybe you've had this time in your life where, you know, when you kind of the foot's to the pedal, the pedal's to the metal, but you also know you're just holding the wheel and you're controlling the car really well. And it's a bit like that for me right now. So as much as you know, the time frame's, you know, pretty much six weeks from now. Um, I'm also really excited about just what we're doing. Or, or, or I I'm feel good because I see momentum going and it's all going in the right direction. So it's quite cool. Now, today's show, um, in, a, in a couple of weeks from now, I may even try to get this person on the podcast uh, to do an interview at some stage, but I'm doing a talk with one of the All Black assistant coaches, uh, a guy called Greg Feek. And uh we're doing a talk for some fitness instructors and we are kind of just had a bit of a chat around what we should do in the talk uh, and I was kind of being the, the fitness professional or the person within the industry who's kind of the leader and he's obviously working with the very top end high performance environment which is the all black environment. Now I know this is a very international audience so the Kiwi listeners and maybe people who rugby playing nations would know who the all blacks are. But if you don't know who the All Blacks are, for people in America and in places in other parts of the world, the All Blacks are arguably one of the most successful sporting teams of all time. They have uh, something like a nearly a, a 90% success win rate in the history of the game. Uh, they've won World Cups. That you know, They're just a very, very successful sporting team. And being a very successful t- sporting team for a long period of time. And so whenever you get an opportunity, actually a few episodes, probably about this time last year actually, I had interviewed Brad Moore who was just becoming an All Black coach at that stage and I got a lot of amazing feedback from Brad. And the thing about the All Blacks is you're going into a high performance environment. You know, like, high. you know, I always think about sports stars, you know, you think about people can be so critical of sports stars and, and I get it, they're in front of all of us but you know, how often after a day's work do people criticise you about your day's work or not even criticise, just just watch and see how you work and you could you imagine the pressure you would feel if every day every performance you did people were judging you, were making assessments on it and, and that kind of constant feedback and the thing you got to remember about your sports stars is they're often very young people, you know like I'm in my mid 40s now, to think that if you know some All Blacks would be in their early 20s and amazing athletes but still you know finding their kind of way in life, it's, it's quite phenomenal when you think about the pressure that these young people are under and the other thing is, is it's the kind of in many ways they're not allowed to make mistakes and I kind of think that's you know, obviously there's massive mistakes you can make, but, you know, like sometimes they make just mistakes any other early 20-year-old's going to make. And uh, unfortunately, these people get harshly punished for just some pretty typical mistakes. But anyway, high performance. Now, one thing the old blacks have 
I've been talking to Greg about this, and it's called the high performance triangle. The high performance triangle, and there's obviously there's the kind of three pillars, and there's actually a fourth pillar to it. The high performance triangle that they use in trying to bring high performance out of their culture, the individuals, and the team as a whole, and probably all the people who support the team as well. And Greg told me about this high performance triangle, and I thought, oh, I could really, I could kind of dig deep into this. So in today's episode, that's what we're going to dig into is the high, the All Blacks high performance triangle. What are the three components? How maybe you can implement this into your life, and uh, yeah, we'll be interested to see how we go with this. Now, before we do get into this, I do want to touch on one other quick subject. I was interviewing a guy last week on my other podcast, and actually, I'm going to pause because I should say his name. So, pause. I'm going to pause. We're back in one second, and I am back. The magic of podcasting. His name was Owen Everard. Now, Owen is uh, well. He's a, he's a kind of a sports physio slash. Um, well, he, he basically works in, on the body, really, micro, um, biomechanics and stuff like this. He's got a PhD in biomechanics, but he was also a very elite runner. Uh, one of the Irish's top runners for many years. I think he's in the twilight of his career right now, but he's kind of one of those guys who would go to championship games and, and race against people like Mo Farah and some of the rock stars of the running world. He never actually made it to the Olympics, but he was of a level who, you know, getting to the Olympics was within his reach. And it was, it was really cool because we kind of talked about some technical stuff that are, are important for triathletes to know about. But before we did, I just was kind of curious about him as an athlete and his career. And we talked a couple of things. And a couple of things that really shined for me was, first of all, I asked him, you know, what was the difference between him and the guys who win the medals? You know, the, the real elite elite. You know, because Owen, if you're even, cons- like one thing I always think is people don't comprehend how amazing an athlete is who even gets to the Olympics. And Owen didn't even get to the Olympics, and this guy's a phenomenal athlete. And so people don't even comprehend, like anyone who's competing at the Olympics is a rock star of an athlete. Is like a rock star. And I guarantee in their local area, they dominate the sport that they do. But then, you know, getting to the Olympics is a big achievement. But then there's those, the, the athletes who who are the next level. And one thing that Owen was talking about was he's talking about when you train with the people who are of the next level, they have the ability to go to the the mentally and physically hardest place all the time. And you're saying, you know, like, you know, like like Owen was an amazing athlete himself. And, you know, so he, you know, you don't you don't get you don't get to think about qualifying for the Olympics if you don't know how to work hard, especially in a sport like running, because it is such a hard sport. And you're just saying, you know, but the, the top guys and girls can just day in, day out know how to go to that place and go to that place consistently in, in ways that many others can't. And he said that was one thing that was really cool. But one other thing he talked about in our little interview, which I really loved, he was talking about how there was one year in his career which really helped him in a massive way. And it was a year he had a really poor performing year. So he had a year where, you know, he was doing really well for a few years. And then he had a year where just he, he performed like crap. And didn't get the performances he wanted, didn't perform at the level he should, um, underperformed, and was a really disappointing year. And he said that was actually the most important year of his life. And the reason was, and this is the bit that I found really fascinating, he said the reason was is the year I had the crap year where everything, you know, my performances were bad, my, my, I didn't get the placings I wanted, everything was a disappointment. At the end of the year, everyone was who was in my life still loved and accepted me. And he said up until that moment, he he almost had a fear that if I do not perform as an athlete, I will be rejected by my world. And there was this kind of pressure, that, that, that pressure of if I'm not performing, will I be loved or will I be accepted, ultimately led him to a place where he wasn't enjoying the sport. And then he has this year where he totally underperforms and he realized, actually, my foundation of unconditional love and unconditional support isn't necessarily dependent on the results of these races. And he said, once I had that moment, everything changed. Because the why of why I was running totally shifted. I just want to have adventures. I just want to grow as a person. It was just these life experiences. And, and it gave me a freedom to, to approach running in a different way. And he said, from that poor year onwards, he just absolutely loved the journey that he was on. And I I love this story because I think it's a really important story to reinforce. And and I'm sure I would have talked about this on the podcast in the past, but 
What are you chasing that you think you need for acceptance and love from others that maybe isn't true? Like for Owen, he thought, I need to be bringing the results in to be accepted and supported from those people in my world. Now, I get that maybe, you know, and you know, for him, like, um, if he was financially supported by the government agency, it'd be a bit different. Like, if he wasn't, you know, like in many sporting agencies, like High Performance New Zealand, uh, you have to get results to get money. So I get in that situation, if you didn't get results, maybe your funding would be cut back. But the fundamental people who love and support me, they don't necessarily, they're going to love me and support me even if I don't get great results. And I just kind of wonder... And what was really interesting, I'm kind of thinking on my head here, but one thing that was I found really interesting about this was, A, he didn't quit. It didn't mean that he gave up the thing. He still loved running. He just shifted the why. And from that moment forward, his enjoyment of the thing increased massively. So he enjoyed running so much more. Secondly, it's an important thing for us to think about because sometimes we are chasing things because we think that's where we're going to get support and acceptance. And let's be honest, we all want to be accepted, we all want to be loved, we all want to feel that we have a good base around us, we want that unconditional thing, and, and so we will do things in our life that are chasing that, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but maybe a healthy thing to realise is who are the people who will be there no matter what, and to know that they'll be there, and does that shift your why of the thing that you're currently doing that maybe is about chasing the love of others, or the acceptance of others? Now, I'm not going to dig too deep into this day, but I just thought it was a really cool thing to be thinking about. And it was I just found it fascinating because basically after that moment, his performance increased. So he became a higher performer as an athlete. He enjoyed the sport a whole lot more. And ultimately, he stayed in the sport for a lot longer than what he would have if he was just trying to chase results to get acceptance from others. And let's be honest, it was a much healthier way for him to live his life. So... Maybe something then there for you. Now, before I get into the main gist of the show, I just want to say thank you to the patrons. If you want to be a patron of the Bevan James Isles show, go to bevanjamesisles.com. Look up, uh, what is it? Go to podcast. You'll see a little yellow button say support me. Go through the process, support me in what I do. Every time I release the show, you better give everybody your hard earned money in my way. Anyway, these are some of the patrons of the show. We've got Ali Brown, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. We've got Patricia King, love me tender. We've got Esther Chin Green, the golden one. We've got Sam, squiggly wiggly arms green. We've got Olivia, Wonder Girl, Alice Garland, and Sean, Dr. Sustain. Barnes, these are all amazing supporters of the podcast. So if you are a supporter, thank you very much. And if you want to become a supporter or a patron, go to bevanjamesisles.com and follow the process. Anyway, let's get into the main gist of the show. So the All Blacks, so I kind of talked about the, the All Blacks earlier, didn't I? I kind of talked about how they're such a high-performing team. And... Um, and, and interestingly, the ability to pass it on for generation to generation. And I'm going to be talking about the concept I talk, introduced before, which is this kind of um, high-performance triangle that the All Blacks work around. And what I want to do today in the show is I kind of want to introduce a triangle and maybe spend some time thinking about each area and how you can apply this to your own life. And one thing I do want to say here, because um, I was talking to someone the other day, actually. I was talking to someone who was a little bit disappointed in some athlete who had kind of lost their health post-career. Who was I talking to? I was talking to someone about this. They were talking about how, um, oh yeah, there's a, there's a rower in New Zealand who, uh, one of the greatest rowers of all time, um, phenomenal athlete, gold medal winner, winner um, at the Olympics, phenomenal athlete, and since giving up the sport, has put on weight. I was, a, I was a hairdresser. There you go. I was at a hairdresser. I wasn't my normal hairdresser. I was at a hairdresser. Now, where was I? Up in Auckland with a hairdresser. And she was saying she was really disappointed this person had become overweight since giving up their sport. And um, I kind of, I had to defend the athlete. Now, the athlete, when I say put on some weight, they've, they've definitely, you know, you, you do notice it. You know, you do notice that this person's, and, and it's probably a little bit of an unhealthy weight. They're not massively overweight, but they put on some weight. And I had to defend the athlete. And the reason I had to defend the athlete is when you go from being a high-performance athlete going to everyday life, it's a massive shift. And and I want to kind of talk about this before we go into the All Blacks high-performance triangle because if you're an Olympic athlete and you're representing your country, there is an infrastructure 
and systems and everything about your life is you being is bringing the best out of yourself. And and the thing about we we often forget about these high performance athletes is that kind of thing of infrastructure. They have an infrastructure around them. It's coaches. Um, you know, medical teams. Nowadays, I probably have high performance coaches as well. You know, the team environment. Everything about what they do is designed to bring the best out of them. And then what happens is they finish their career, and all of that's gone in a second. Like all of that's gone in a second. And it's easy for us to sit on the sideline and be critical of people who come out of those environments and maybe, you know, put on some weight or aren't what they used to be. But we do need to comprehend or understand that these people have gone from being in an environment that's all about this one thing. It's all about training all the time. It's all about bringing the best out of the review, bang, bang, bang. And, you know, in a perfect world, you say, well, hopefully these people leave with the skills and to be able to do that by themselves. But that's a totally different skill set. Actually, interesting, a couple of years ago, I did a talk, just before COVID, I did a talk at one of our, our local one of our local private high schools. It's a very top-end school. Uh, Parents pay a lot of money to go to school. And when you go to school, you can see where the money goes. The kids are amazing. They get amazing opportunities. Um, You know, like, it's an expensive school, but it's money well spent. And I went to talk to these kids because one thing I talked to these kids was is about, there was basically kids who were in the last year of high school or the last couple of years of high school. And I was talking to them about because they wanted to, some, someone had asked me, just to give you some context, someone had asked me if I could do a talk about training for a half marathon for them as a group. And I wanted to pitch it along the line of one thing you guys need to learn to do is learn how to be independent with exercise in your life. And I kind of talked about this kind of high, I didn't really use the, what I was talking about with that, that athlete before, but. These girls in this school, it's a, it's a girls only school and it's, again, it's a phenomenal school. Now these girls, they have so much support and structure around them that helps them be a high performer, you know, and, and not just in sport, but in school. So I, I don't know the figures of the school, but I imagine they get better results in schools that, you know, you maybe everyday school because because the money they, their parents spend, there's a higher level of infrastructure and support that goes around these things. They get better coaches, they get more coaches, they get and so on and so on. And my talk to them was about, you guys are in the last moment of this schooling period. You've got a year, maybe 18 months to go in this schooling period. And then in a year and 18 months from now, the rug's going to be pulled under from underneath your feet. And you are now suddenly going to be someone who doesn't have the infrastructure around you. Because basically when you go to university, and for those who have been to university, you know what happens. University, you're kind of on your own. Now, that's not completely true. You have your, your groups, you have, you know, there, are, there is a support network in university. But if you've come from a high-performing school with great infrastructure and great systems and great support and, you know, high-level stuff, to university where it's kind of just about yourself with a little bit of structure and a little bit of support, you have to learn a total new skill set. And this was my talk to these girls. It was like, Signing up for this half marathon is a good challenge for you to do, but really what you want to do is you want to use it as an opportunity for you to start to develop health and fitness in your life outside of these four walls, outside of this school, because in the next moment, you're going to be facing that. And, and you see this a lot, you know, like I, 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 I deal with a lot of, you know, my, my target market for my burger and running groups kind of 35 through to 55. And most of these, and I'll be honest, it's, it's main t- tends to be more of a female-based target market. Um, we do get some men, but we do tend to get more females. And most of these females would have been females who left school enjoying fitness in a really good place. And then they get into the real world, and they haven't developed those independent skills. And then other things happen. Then you go to university, and university's busy, and so on and so on. So when we, th- and, and I haven't even t- touched on the high-performance triangle here, but One thing we've got to remember is that often athletes are in environments that are designed to make the best of them. And then the day they quit, their whole life changes and then they no longer have the infrastructure and support around them. Now, the best athletes would have created independent skills to be able to do this. And um, and as we touch on this all black structure for high performance, maybe that's what they're trying to do with the all blacks nowadays. 
But not everyone is. And so when you see athletes come out of their career, don't be too critical if they're no longer the athlete they were. And the other thing to recognise is maybe they just don't want to train like a beast anymore. Like if you've trained for 20 years of your life and you just train, 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 maybe, maybe you don't want to do that. The other thing to recognise as well is that when you're an athlete training like an Olympic rower, you can eat a bit poorly. You know, so you kind of, there are some habits you can get away with because you train so much. So again, I, this is kind of wasn't the subject I was going to talk about, but I'm going to get into that in a second. So going back to the All Blacks, the All Blacks walk into that environment. So if you become an All Black, or even I imagine if you're potential being an All Black, the All Black system is creating an environment that's designed to get the best out of you. Because they need you to be the best performing athlete on the field when your opportunity presents itself. So that's the other thing about. Now, let's go to this All Black High Performance Triangle. So when you move into the All Blacks, they have a thing called a High Performance Triangle. And I'll tell you the basic kind of fundamentals of it. And then I'll kind of break down how I think you can implement this in your own life. So the High Performance Triangle says there's three main kind of points to it. And then there's one underlying thing as well. So the first is mindset. The mindset you have in this environment. The second is your skill set. The third is your structure. And then underlining all of this is your well-being. So what are the mindsets that create that you need to be a high performer? What are the skills that you need? And then what's the structure that helps you bring the best out of yourself? And then underlying all this, how do you maintain good well-being in your life to be a high performer? Now, going back to my thing around from environments, because let's be honest, most of us, don't live in high performance environments. You know, most of us get up and go to work, and, and you, know, you might have a work that's trying to grow you and stuff, but high performance environments. Most of us don't work in those. So, so I'm kind of looking at this as more of an individual, not a, an environmental thing. I'm, I'm, I want you to reflect upon this today as the individual skills that you need to develop yourself to get the most out of this. So again, it's mindset, skill set, structure, and underlying that we have well-being. So I'm going to break down each of these areas. I'm just going to throw some things for you to think about in high-performing for yourself. Now, you can kind of bring this into an overall high-performing self. So can I be a high-performer in all areas of my life? Or you may want to choose one or two areas of your life where you just want to focus on having high performance. So it might be a hobby, it might be a sport, it might be a career, whatever. I was going to throw this at you. And this is one of those podcasts that... It could be a bit of a work on. So you might listen to this and you might say, actually, I'm going to grab a piece of paper, grab a workbook, go back and listen to this, work through some of the things that Bevan's talked about here and design a bit of a plan for you around this. So let's touch on it. First of all, mindsets. Now we know what mindsets is and we know the difference between um, fixed mindset and growth mindset. We, we tend to know what that is nowadays, so I won't go too deep into that. Fixed is I can't grow. Growth mindset means I can develop myself in this area. But when we think about the mindsets you need, we want to spend, and if we think about development pathway for you in this, the first thing we want to understand is do you need to spend, where do you spend time in developing this side of you? Now, I've got to be honest, most people don't spend time on developing mindset ability. Most people don't spend time in developing mindset ability. You know, even like mind tools, like uh, I know I've raved on about that chatter tool. I plan in my week, when am I going to use chatter? Like I plan it. I plan in my day, when am I going to use chatter? Because it's a mind tool and it's a mindset tool that helps me bring the best out of myself. And now most people don't actually work on their thinking strategies. So the first thing to ask yourself is, am I working on my thinking strategies? Okay, so it's worth first thing. Now, if you do want to develop them, I've got some questions for you to think about. First of all, you need to identify the mindsets that work for you. And when we look at, look at this, we're going to look at this in two ways. When you think about your own mindsets, what are mindsets that you currently hold that are positive and work for you and helping you move towards high performance? Okay, so what are ones that you currently hold that you know work for you? So for example, one mindset I currently hold is, I'm a hard worker. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a hard worker and I know I can grow. It's a really good mindset to have when I'm thinking about high performance. Also, when we think about mindsets that could work for you, is to spend time to spend time discovering ones that you maybe don't have. And this is, and in all three of these steps, mentorships and guidance is a really good thing to think about. So you might want to interview somebody in the area that you know you want to develop yourself in. 
and just to explore what mindsets they have in these areas. What are their thinking strategies that they have in this area? You know, this is what we want to, you know, this is because you you won't know everything. So the first thing we want to identify is, you know what, being a hard worker who knows I can grow, that's a great mindset to have. But I don't know some of the areas. So I'm going to go talk to, I don't know, let's just say running, and a great runner and talk to them about what mindsets they have. And what they'll be able to do is open you up to mindsets that you currently can't see, and it's a really good thing to have. The second thing to go is, what are my current mindsets that I have that work against me? What are my current mindsets that I have that work against me? So I'll think of me, I'm on the piano. One of my old mindsets was I'm not a creative piano player. Okay, that's a mindset that's working against me being a high performing musician. So again, those three steps. What are the ones that work for you that you currently have? How do you discover ones that you don't have that you can work on? And which ones are working against you? Now what we want to do is we want to determine the mindsets that we want to be practicing in our life, and particularly when we're doing these activities. So the mindsets that, you know, like, what are the mindsets? So obviously we want to reinforce the ones that that are good for you, and then you want to be injecting the mindsets that you've learned from other people or mentors that can help you be more successful, and obviously we want to suppress the mindset or work, work through the mindsets that are holding us back. The next thing we want to do is we want to put time aside where we're going to practice what or preload the mindsets we're going to use when we experience the activity we want to do. So, interesting. Okay, so last week I went for a run. I had to do a 40-minute 40 minute, 40 minute run. I had to do 30 minutes at moderately hard. Um, and I haven't been doing moderately hard running in a while. And it was also going to be happening at the end of a very busy day. So I was going to be mentally tired and... Um, going to be challenged within that. So I didn't just get up and go for my run. I gave myself five minutes. I remember I drove to the park, and then before I got out of the car, I just gave myself a couple minutes. I said five minutes. It probably took me a minute or two just to preload the mindsets and the attitude and the thinking that I was going to have in this run. Now, I, I nailed the run. I had a really good run. Um, but the thing was, I practiced, and I spent time preloading the thinking that I was going to put in place at this time. And that's what we want to think about is you, you, you don't want to hit the moment and go, oh, where's the mindset? We want to commit a time where we're going to practice and preload the, how we're going to use our mindsets at that time. Okay, so, and this is probably an important step when we talk about this when we get to structure. If we're going to, if we're going to develop our skill as mindset, we have to put the time aside to be able to develop that skill. Secondly, or number four I think it is, is in the moment, Learn what you're, when, you, when you're actually experiencing the thing you're trying to do. So again, let's go back to me last Tuesday. When I'm doing the run, practice the mindset. And, and, and make it a really conscious process. And you're kind of doing a couple of things right here. First of all, you're practicing the mindset that you've preloaded and you've identified that you're trying to work on. Secondly, you're also trying to see if your other mindsets that work against you are coming in place and which ones you'd want to, to put in place at this time. So you know, let's just say me being creative on the piano, you know, I, I could go, okay, today my mindset I'm going to have when I practice on the piano is I'm developing my ability to write basic songs. Okay, that's a, that's a good mindset to have and it opens me up to developing and writing basic songs. Um, and then I'm kind of done with the piano and I feel that, oh, but you're not a creative person, come up. That's a catch moment. What I do, I redirect my focus back to, oh, okay, well, don't worry about that thought right now. Just put your mindset back to, I'm developing my ability to write basic songs, okay? So see what you're doing there, and that's when I'm actually on the keyboards doing the practice. So within that time, that's what you're focusing on, is when I'm experiencing the thing, try to be in the mindsets that I preloaded, and just be aware of when my actions or my thinking is taking me to a mindset that can work against me. Then what we want to do is post the experience, we want to look for the moments that worked, for evidence that we can reinforce, and just any learnings that can help us get better in this mindset. So it might be, um, I one learning I learned was, I, I did go to that place where I was feeling about, you know, you're not creative on the piano, and I did work through it. I did go to that place where I found the better mindset again, but I probably sat in the in the restrictive mindset for five minutes. So next time, one thing I want to work on is less time and a mindset that's working against me. Okay. 
Secondly, when you're doing that post-reflection, I love the idea of attaching evidence to mindset. You would have heard me talk about this before. It's that whole idea of, um, you know, at the end of the piano session or at the end of the run last week, I once I've had the run, I've hit the objective of the run, I can go, this here is evidence of the mindset I preloaded. So, and again, if I do the piano, uh, so let's say I've kind of partly written a beginner basic song. This here is evidence of the mindset that I am developing my ability to be a, a basic songwriter. Okay, so this is what we want to think around with mindset. And I think one of the key things I really want you to take away from this aspect is it should be a skill that you're practicing. Okay, it should be a skill that you're practicing. And the biggest fault I think most people have is they don't do that preload time. They don't actually spend a bit of time before they're doing the activity practicing their mindsets. Okay, so again, identify. So I'll just walk you through those steps again. First of all, it's thing you need to develop. You've got to find the mindsets that work against for you. Discover ones that can be more effective that you don't know. Also, learn the ones that work against you. Before you do the activity, give yourself some time. And again, this may be one of the most important steps to practice putting that mindset in place or preloading that mindset. When you're in the activity, practice staying in that mindset. Catch when you go back to old ones and go back to new one. And then post, attach the evidence, reinforce what you did well, and just see if there's anything you could work on. Like if you think about yourself right now, do you think you'd be better in, in, in having great mindsets in your life if you put this process in your life? And if we go to high performance, if you can be using high performance more often, surely that would be the case. The next area they talk about is skill set. Now when we think about skill sets as a rugby player, it's pretty obvious, you know, depending on the position you're playing in the field, there's going to be different skills that are, are prioritised in your position and again different positions require different skills like like a, a number 10 or a halfback uh, who kicks the ball and passes the ball and runs fast and you know high kind of those kind of skills don't need to know about scrumming you know what I mean like they don't need to know how to be a prop and a prop doesn't have to spend time doing kicking so the first thing is when we think about skill sets I always think we want to do a skills assessment and when you think about the area that you're working on. So a skills assessment would break down all the different skills that you would want to develop in this area based on what's important to you. Okay, so you want to do a skills assessment. And this is another one of those areas where you want to get a mentor beside you or a coach beside you. Because when we think about the skills that you're trying to develop, you will already have some skills and you'll have some strengths and you have some weaknesses, but you may also have some areas you just don't even see. And that's the value of a mentor and a coach or a coach is that they they just they, they know more than you so they can give you a better guidance of that so the first thing we want to do is do a skills assessment of all the different skills that are in your area okay now when you do the skills assessment you can also do um oh no i'll go to that in a second then what you want to do is you want to create a create an understanding of the skills you need for success and this is you know like when we think about all areas like when we think about running running's a really pretty basic skill it's not like a golf swing um, but there's different types of running like if you're training to be a 1500 meter runner that's a different skill than a marathon runner and so you want to understand the skills that are applicable to what you're trying to achieve and I think that's really important so do a skills assessment understanding the skills that are applicable to what you're trying to achieve once you've got that overview of all the different skills you need the next thing you want to do is do a grading of where your current skills sit based on the important areas you need to develop. So you might you might do a skills assessment on the area that you're figuring out, and there might be eight fundamental skills that are key to success in your world, okay, in that area. Then what you want to do is you want to give yourself a grade of where you're, how you're doing in those areas. And this is also another good time to spend some time with a mentor slash coach. Because of what the mentor slash coach will, is, they might be able to give you a better assessment. Some because you know, like some people have an unrealistic self-assessment. Now, unrealistic sometimes too positive, unrealistic sometimes too negative. You know, so if you can get someone who can sit beside you and go, actually, I think you're a four out of ten here, and here's why. Because you can do this, this, and that, but here's what a five looks like, and I don't think you're there right now. And so that that kind of outside perspective gives you a much better ability to to see where you need to develop your or where you are right now. Now, one thing I think that's a really cool thing to think about around your skill development is to give yourself short time frames where you're focusing on only one or two areas. Now, just going back to the grading thing, there'll be some areas you're doing great in. There'll be some areas you may be like a 10 out of 10. And there'll be some you might be like a 2 out of 10, and there'll be some in that mid-range. And obviously, the areas you're great in, 
you know, we want to maintain that and maybe evolve that a little bit. But there, there will be some areas where you'll see massive jumps in success if you can focus on that skill development. And so what we want to think is we want to identify what's the most powerful skills to develop right now that will have the biggest impact based on what I'm trying to achieve right now. So with your mentor and your coach, let's say you've got 10 different areas you need to assess. Two of them you're like almost like a 10 out of 10. Four of them you're like a 4 out of 10. And four of them like a 6 to 9 out of 10. And then four of them you're like a, a 1 to 5 out of 10. Now, you can't fix them all at once. You really can't. And so what you want to do is you want to give yourself a time frame where you're going to give yourself a couple areas where you're really going to focus on. And it's a good idea to kind of go, what's going to give me the best bang for my buck? So you might say, and I, again, I haven't really given a top an area here, but you might just say there's two areas that I'm going to work on for the next 10 weeks or the next six weeks. And I'm just going to spend two hours a week focusing on the developing my skill set in these two areas. And currently one area I'm a 6 out of 10, one I'm a 2 out of 10. So the aim is the next six weeks is to get the 2 out of 10 up to 5 and the 6 up to an 8. And now you can see what that does is it helps to give us a singular focus. Now the thing is, in six weeks you're not going to get all areas up to 10 out of 10. And also if you try to get all areas up to 10 out of 10 at one time, you're kind of setting yourself up to fail because it's just too overwhelming. Whereas if you were to just to kind of break that down and go one or two areas that will have a massive impact and then be really singular focused. Because the other thing I like about this is when you sit down and you know I've just got to focus on this in this next moment, you know, you use your time more wisely. So identifying the areas, then what you want to do is develop a skills development plan. And again, this will be where you use your coach and mentors. So at this stage, you'll sit down, okay, here's the area I'm a two out of 10. What will it take for me to get to five? And what is the plan of action that I need to do? So, you know, let's just, let's use rugby, for example. I'm, I'm going to be a goal kicker. I'm currently like a two out of 10. What are the things I need to work on for the next six weeks to get at five out of 10? Okay, it might be I need to get think better at thinking about my head placement, where I'm looking. I uh, might be thinking about getting my run through done. Um, might be thinking about thinking about how much power I need to connect with the ball. Those are the four things I'm going to focus on for the next six weeks. And I'm going to spend two hours a week focusing on these things. Now you can see that if you spend two hours a week just really narrowly focus on those two things or those areas yet in that area, you're going to become a better kicker, aren't you? And that's what we want to think about. So you want to develop a skills development plan with your coach and mentor in a time frame that's realistic and also that sets up the amount of time you're going to spend on that area each week. The next thing you want to do with skill set is you've just got to do the work. You know, you've got to do the work. Um... It's interesting, I think about myself as a triathlete. So as a triathlete, I was a, a really hard trainer. I was a consistent trainer. I never did skill work. And you could argue that triathlon skills are pretty low. I never really did run drills. I never really did cycling drills. I did a little bit of swimming technique because my swimming was really terrible when I started. But it wasn't a weekly thing that I worked on. And arguably... If I, you know, I spent, like I was training a lot. So I was training, you know, probably averaging 25 hours a week for eight years of my life. So I was probably better off to train a little bit less on the hard stuff and spend a bit more time on skill development and I would have been a faster athlete. Like instead of, I think I swam five days a week when I was doing Ironman and it'd be generally a 3K swim up to a 4.5K swim. Um, I was probably better off to swim five, four days a week and just do a one skill set session a week. But my problem was I loved hard work, but that was working against me. And this is what we're going to think about in skill development. I would have been a better swimmer to spend that hour just, you know, learning a better catch, learning better posture, learning better kick, learning breathing, you know, spending time on that. If I'd spent an hour a week just doing that, I guarantee I would have got a faster swimmer than just doing another hour of hard swimming. And so when it comes to doing the work, often the skill work is the thing that people neglect the most. And... Like me, it can often be the area that gives us the biggest amount of reward. And so, especially if you're someone like me who values hard work, so if we go back to mindsets, so that could be a mindset I could be working on. Always working hard isn't the wisest way forward. That's a good mindset to be practicing in the mindsets, isn't it? 
you know, that's a good mindset for me to practice. My mindset, you could argue, well, hard working and being consistent is a great mindset to have, but always working hard isn't. And so that's, we go back to mindset. So skill development, do the work and make sure you put it into your diaries. Like if I were to go back to doing Ironman, which I can't really see happening in my life, but who knows what my future looks like, that would be something I would definitely do. And I think about my piano play nowadays, I do a lot more work on skill development. And then the last step in skill set is assess, review and test. So what you want to be doing as a part of that period of time, so let's say you choose an eight-week period where you're going to focus on a couple of skills and, and you do actually plan to do an hour a week or two hours a week in that, in that area, then what you want to be doing is having assessments often, so review, and testing often. So it might be that you have a fitness test that you do or a skills test that you do. Uh, like on the piano, I could record my playing, stuff like that. So that's how we want to approach skill set development. Again, it's to do a skills assessment of all the skills you need to be successful in the area, create an understanding of, of this with guided, guided support, grade your different skills where they currently sit right now, then determine one or two areas that you want to work on that will have a massive impact. And, and really what you want to think about is the areas that will have the biggest impact in the shortest period. Um, then the time frame and the structure around how you're going to put that in place. Then get your plan in place with your coach and your mentor. Do the work, assess, test, and review. The last part of the, the triangle is what they call structure. Now to me, and I haven't actually done talk degree yet, so I'm not quite sure what they mean by structure, but I'm interpreting this as in the structure you need to be a high performer. Now early on I talked a lot about the, the girls at the school who had that great infrastructure about them. The athletes like the All Blacks, like the rower, who have this great infrastructure around them. But if you're an everyday person, we don't tend to have those structures around us. So if we want to be a high performer, it does have to be a more of a self-guided thing. So when we think about self-structure, we're thinking about things like planning tools. So for me, it's my weekly meeting. It's my weekly review process. It's my weekly assessment of my week. For me, it's my morning meeting, my, my writing my objectives for my day. For me, it's my reflection tools at night. It's for me using my support network in really powerful ways. So, so understanding my support network and also communicating in ways that allow me to bring the best out of myself and, and for them to support me in the best way possible. So when we think about structure, what I think we're thinking about is how do I create a life that allows for my mindset and my skill set development to go in place. You know, because unfortunately, all the best plans in the world won't work if you're a terrible planner. You know what I mean? You could, you could go away and do an hour on this work here and do some mindset work and skill set work. But if, you are, if you're a terrible planner, that ain't going to happen, is it? You know, you're not going to, you're not going to do it. So when we think about this, I'm thinking of those basic life skills. That where are your life skills around self-organization? Where are your life skills around support, using support really wisely? Where are your mind skills, life skills around how to get more out of yourself? Like, you know, like I, was, I think I've talked on the show recently about this, but this kind of concept of, you know, some people are good at being consistent of turning up to exercise, and then there's some people who are consistently turning up and delivering the, on the objective. And those are two different things. And to me, I don't think you should be spending that much time on hitting objectives if you can't be consistent, because consistency is going to always outweigh hitting objectives. Like if you, if you let's just use running again, if you want to be a great runner, and you go, but you only do two sessions every couple of weeks, and you smash yourself in those two sessions, you hit those objectives, but then you don't train outside of them, you're not going to do as well as somebody who only turns up and does the sessions without hitting objectives. The person who runs consistently will do better. So you've got to think of how you lay the foundation, but what does it take to be a consistent runner? Well, there's going to be an organisational level in your life. And when we think about structure, that's what we think about, is what are your personal management skills that you need to bring the best out of yourself. And unfortunately for a lot of people, this is something that ebbs and flows. So a lot of people, their personal management skills will be reliant on the challenge they have in front of them. So let's say they've got a big study period coming up and they know they've got a lot on their plate. So they'll become a really awesome personal manager and they'll really smash that period and then the study period finishes and they stop doing the personal management tools that help them be a higher level version of themselves. And so ultimately they regress as a person. And, and what I, I always think is that your job is to understand your personal management skills and they're a consistent thing in your life. 
You know, that, that's the, you know, like, like me, my weekly meeting happens every Sunday. You know, my, my morning meeting happens every morning. I did it this morning. My, my, th- these happen every day. Because if I can have a good structure in my life where I've got great personal management skills, I'm going to be able to do the work around mindset, I'm going to do the skill set work, and I'm going to be able to bring better levels out of myself. Now, another thing around structure, which I haven't tapped on, is the environment you put yourself in. Because as much as I've talked about high-performance environments like the All Blacks and like that school, you can determine to go to environments that are going to help you be successful. So it can be you can join an amazing gym that just knows how to bring the best out of you. I like to think my runners get more out of themselves when my, they're in my running environment. It's an environment, it's a structure that brings the best out of themselves. So you can move towards environments that help you be a higher version of yourself. And actually, I think you must move towards environments that help you bring a higher version of yourself. You know, I think doing it by yourself is a harder way forward. So when we think about structure, and probably one thing I'd say here is, a good way to look at this is when you've been your best, what were your personal management skills that you were applying at that time? And are you applying them right now? And if not, how do you bring them back to your life? Now, we could talk about the evolution of that moving forward. But at this stage, I don't, you know, that well, well if you are in a space where you've got that, you can then kind of go, how do I improve these? It's the next step in the process. And then, if, and then the last step of that is, then what environments do I put myself in that give me a structure that brings the best out of myself? And fitness is a great example of this because a great fitness environment brings the best out of people. Now, I'm sure there's in all other areas is that as well. So it could be a study environment, it could be a hobby environment, it could be a work environment, and so on and so on. So that's the first, third kind of aspect to the pillar here is the structure, and, I, and I'm putting this in two ways, the life management skills that you have and are you consistently applying them and evolving them and the environments you need to put yourself into to bring the best out of yourself. The last step that they talk about is the underlying is well-being. Now well-being is pretty obvious so I won't touch on it too much but how's your sleep going? How's your nutrition going? What's happening for your relationships? How are you doing with your healthy outlets? Things like finances. If you're looking after those things in your life, you have the better ability to be a high performer in the thing you're trying to be a high performer in. But let's let's flip that upside down. If you're not sleeping and you're eating like crap and your relationships are horrible and when you struggle you drink alcohol and you smoke and you you know you you know, withdraw from the world and your money's you know you're up to, up to your eyeballs. How good are you going to be at being a higher performer? It's going to be harder, eh? So that's that kind of, it's almost like the foundation of everything. That if you can get those well-being tools in place and be consistent with them, then your ability to have better mindsets, better skill sets, and better structure is going to be more in place. So one of your focuses should be, how do I look after my well-being in my life? So to recap, high performance model. This is the All Blacks high performance triangle. Mindset, skill set, structure. Underlying that, we have well-being. Ideally, in all of these areas here, all of us can have work-ons. And I said at the beginning of this episode that maybe what you want to do is you want to think about, um, you want to think about putting some time aside to do this work on this. And this, is, you know, if you take any way thing away from any of my podcasts, do the work, do the work. <laughs> you know, like. Do the work. I guarantee if you if you commit to practicing mindset, you'll get better at mindsets. I guarantee if you do the work around skill set, you'll get better at skill set. I guarantee if you improve your structure, you'll get better at that. And if you can do all three at once, then your high performance is going to come and you'll be that higher version of yourself. I actually want to share something with you. I want to share... A proud moment with you. Um, I actually talked about this on Instagram the other day, but I want to share it with you guys. Um, the moment of accomplishment. I got my book. So a couple of days ago, my my publisher, because, wait, I want to grab my book right now. Give me a second. Here we go. I've got it in my hand. You can't see it. I know this is podcasting, but I've got it in my hand. Um, my publisher wrote to me, because as I was saying earlier, what happens is you, the printer will send you a couple copies before you actually, before they do the main print, just to see if you're happy with how it looks. And I got an email from my publisher and say, Bevan, something's coming in the mail tomorrow, so be excited. And they said, the book's coming. We're really happy with it. Like, we, we think it looks amazing. We're absolutely stoked with how it's come together. We couldn't have hoped for better. So I was pretty excited. 
the next day you're kind of you know you're waiting all day and, and normally our courier our courier will drop you know our courier deliveries at our door and I'm waiting all day it happens and the courier hasn't arrived and, and then later on the day I went and go to teach a class and it still hasn't arrived and then I get home it still hasn't arrived and I thought well maybe they'll put it in the mailbox check in the mailbox there's a package in the mailbox so I go inside I, I, I kind of come into my office I open the package and there's the book and it was a really cool moment in my life. This book is a book that I've worked realistically in my head. It's been in my head for about four or five years. Like when that first book came out, I thought to myself, I enjoy it. I got lots of good feedback on my first book. But I remember, I think I've talked about this. I got one criticism, which was like, he hasn't brought anything that new to the table. And I, you may, I don't know, maybe I have. Maybe, maybe if you read a lot of, I don't think my first book I think I had, but if you read a lot of kind of, psychology books you probably wouldn't have thought that but not many people have done what I'd done within fitness so you know that would be my argument but it, that's a fair comment most of the feedback I got on my, my first book was you know people loved it but with this book once I got that feedback I could kind of think you know what I do need to do something that's completely different and I do want to do something that's for someone who's not exercising so about not long after writing that first book I thought one day I'll, I'll get around to writing this book and you know these things are kind of in the back of your head and then you know two years ago I started writing the book uh, and then literally, funny, I went back and I, I recommended the in the podcast I did where I, before I went for my back operation and how I was going to deal with my back operation, I recommended it to someone the other day, so I went back and listened to it, it was literally like a year ago, and I was saying, you know, I just about finished writing the book there, and so now, you know, now the book's here, and it, the release date's the 4th of July, and I opened it up, and I got that amazing feeling you get in life sometimes of accomplishment. Now, I, I know the book's not out there yet, so there's still a bit of work to be done before we're actually on the market. But, you know, you, you, you know, I've got the book in my hand right now. You pick up this thing, and you think, wow, like, this has been a massive project. And I've worked really hard at it. Like, I've worked really hard. Um, and I'm still working really hard at it. And at the same time, it was a really cool moment. And... Often in life, you know, accomplishment moments are really important, and it's really important that you enjoy, and I re- that you enjoy them. And I did enjoy it. I felt really proud of myself, and I took it downstairs, and because Joe's been a big part of this book, you know, pretty much she's touched every every aspect of this book. My name gets to be on the title, but she's you know like. Um, she did. She did all my proofing for me before I went to the publisher. Um, she always gives me feedback on every aspect. You know, like it's it's our book, really. And I took downstairs, and you know, she, she was really proud. She, she had sense of achievement, and I don't know. Accomplishments are a really beautiful thing to have in life, and and I just want to share it with you because it means this is a cool moment for me. And, and I know if you're a listener of this podcast for a long time, um, I, I always appreciate the support and everything you give to the show. Um, but I just want to share it with you because it is a really special moment in my life, and and I. <laughs> The one thing I've, I've been saying throughout this whole journey is this is a throw mud at the wall project. As much as I've invested a lot of time and, and resource into getting this book to the market, books are a bit of a pipe dream. You know? And I've got a business strategy, so hopefully I can have a marketing budget so I can get as much reach as possible. Um, and this is something that could go nowhere. But it doesn't mean I can't enjoy the accomplishment along the way. Now, don't get me wrong, I want it to go everywhere. I want it to help as many people as possible. But it's also important you know, those accomplishment moments. And it was just one of those. And, and I just want you to think about your own life. When are your accomplished moments? You know, and are you enjoying them? Like don't 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 rush them. Like I really didn't. I even I took it, you know, I went out for Mother's Day and I, and I took it with my, my my mother and sister to see. You know, it was just an accomplishment moment. And um I want to share that with you today. And if you have accomplishment moments in your life, enjoy them. Don't don't rush them, don't undermine them, don't go, yeah, but just just enjoy them. Because accomplishment moments come from a lot of effort. And one thing we've learnt is that we want to enjoy the effort. We want, we want to enjoy, you know, we want to enjoy the, you know, enjoy sitting down and writing a book when you're feeling tired one day. You know, we want to enjoy the effort. Because if we enjoy the effort, we'll put, always put effort in. But also, we want to enjoy the rewards of our effort. And the ultimate reward of my effort is when I get an email from someone saying, Bev, this book's changed my life. That, that's what I want. And that's that's going to be my ultimate reward. But this moment here was a pretty cool moment as well. So don't undermine your accomplished moments because it's a really important part of your life. On that front, the book is coming out on the 4th of July. 
I've said this in the last few episodes I'm going to be saying until it comes out. When it comes out, please buy it. <laughs> even the book is designed for people who aren't exercising but even if you're not exercising please buy it because I want to get momentum going um, it'll be $37 New Zealand if you're listening to the show for any period of time I'm guarantee I'll, put, I'll give you more than $37 worth of value please make that commitment now and when it comes out be in first bite because that first period is really important because it gets momentum happening and you know, if, if 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 everyone who listens to the show bought the book, that then helps me have a bigger budget, which can help more people have reach. So and it can help you as well. And if if if, if, if you are the hardcore exerciser, pass it, buy it and give it to somebody who's not exercising. Anyway, that's this week's show done and dust. If you want to become a patron on the show, go to bevanjamesisles.com, become a patron, that way you can do that. Uh outside of that, um yeah, keep being you, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks from now. <laughs>